It's quite intense, of course. So, Mr. Uh, Gallarato, and having said that the what the Romans are proposing is confused, <coughs> false, and essentially bad, uh, it goes on to quote the Archbishop. The document is substantially acceptable. It's worse than critical of Christianity, particularly regarding the Council of Magister. Quote from Archbishop of Fair. Our true faithful, those who have understood the problem and who have just precisely helped us to follow the straight line, the firm straight line of tradition and the faith, were afraid of the contacts that I made with Rome. They told me that it was dangerous and I was wasting my time We're back in the 70s and the 80s. Yes, of course, I did hope up to the last minute that at Rome they would show a little loyal, uh, loyalty, um, that they, they, would, they, would, they would show a little fair play. Nobody can reproach me with having not done everything I could. And so now, to those who come to say to me, you must, you must come to an understanding with Rome, I think I can say that I even went a little further than I should have gone. So this is obviously after 1988, and he's talking about how he went nine and a half yards. Not just the full nine yards, he went nine and a half yards to meet Rome. So there's that quote I was referring to. Um, fidelity. So he's, this is a, a question from an interview. I'm not sure what year this is from. Um, I might remember it later. In any case, what do you think of Cardinal Ratzinger's instruction establishing the, the oath of law of fidelity and which includes a profession of faith? Archbishop of Fed. First is the credo, which is no problem. It remains intact. The first and the second sections following are not difficult. Pray present no difficult. They are they're thoroughly normal according to its theology. But the third section is very bad. It means practically lining up on what the bishops of the entire world think today. In other words, that. In the preamble, it is besides clearly indicated that this section was added because of the spirit of the council. It's referring to the council of the so-called magisterium of today, which is the magisterium of the conciliars, of the conciliarists. They should have added, insofar as this magisterium is in full conformity with the tradition. As it stands, the formula is dangerous. And this formula and he's talking, the, the Archbishop is talking about the formulas that Rome is proposing in 1980, probably 88, probably after the consecration, Rome is proposing this formula. It shows the spirit of these people with whom it is impossible to come to an understanding. It is absolutely ridiculous and false, as certain have done, certain people have done, to present this oath of fidelity as a revival of the anti modernist oath. Surprise, suppressed since the council. The whole poison, is, the poison is concentrated in this third section, which seems designed to oblige those who have gone over to Rome to sign this profession of faith and to state their complete agreement with the bishops. It is as though at the time of the Arian heresy, they have said, now you are in agreement with everything that the Arian bishops think. No, I'm not exaggerating. It's clearly expressed in the introduction. It is trickery. One may ask uh, if they, at Rome, they did not mean in this way to correct the text of the protocol which they offered me. Now, as for Rome, the protocol went too far. I realized afterwards that the protocol went too far in that direction. They thought afterwards it's gone too far in the other direction. Although it doesn't satisfy us, it seems still true too much in our favor in the uh, Article 3 of the Doc Doctrinal Declaration because it does not sufficiently express the necessity of our submitting to the Council. And so I think that they're catching up now. They are, without, going, without doubt, going to make these texts signed by the seminarians of, the, of St. Peter's before their ordination, and they're going to make it, have it signed by the priests of St. Peter's who are then going to find themselves in the obligation 
of making an official act of joining the conciliar church. Differently from the protocol that I was due to sign, by these new texts, one submits to the council and to all the bishop, conciliar bishops. This is their spirit, and one will not change them. So Bishop Aguero is quoting the Archbishop, underlining the steadiness of the Romans on the line of the council. That the Romans are intent upon doing that. Next quotation. Uh, also a quote from an interview with the magazine Fidelita. Uh, do you think that the situation has got still worse since uh, before the consecrations you, in, you entered upon the conversations which came to, which ended in the protocol of 5 May 1988? So has the situation got worse? since are the Romans worse than they were at the time of the protocol in May 88? Oh yes, says the Archbishop. For example, the fact that the profession of faith is now demanded by Carpomatia since the beginning of the year 1989. It's very serious because they are demanding of all those who have gone over to Rome or who might do so to make a profession of faith in the documents of the Council and in the post conciliar reforms. For us, that's impossible. So Bishop de Gerrit is showing how the Romans, in, he's quoting Archbishop of Fev, to the effect that the Romans insist on the council. Same thing today. Archbishop, Bishop de Gerrit goes on on his own. In fact, that corresponds perfectly to the thought, to the thinking, and to the position taken by the, the, Roman, the Roman Commission throughout our doctrinal discussions of the last year and a half. This, the doctrinal sessions 2009-2011, Bishop McGarry was there every eight, he, he, he headed the SSPX delegation for every one of the eight sessions and he comes out of those sessions saying that what I just quoted to you of the Archbishop from 1988, and they're around there, is exactly the same in 2011-2012. Just the same. Today, they are not ready to renounce to give up the Second Vatican Council. It's essential for the, our question today, this was actually the end of 2011, the end of last year, to remember the what we clearly recognized at, on that occasion. They, on the occasion of the doctrinal discussions, they are not willing to give up Vatican II, nor the liberal doctrines of Vatican II, and their intention and their clear will is to bring us over to Vatican II. That's what the discussions were as far as Rome was concerned. At the very most, Rome would accept a rebalancing and a better formulation, but it would always be in the, within the limits of the Pope's hermeneutic of renewal and continuity. And there, there we're allowed to discuss, to enter into discussion, and we may even be useful in order to rubber stamp their renewal of the reform with continuity. The renewal of the reform with continuity. So, Bishop Elrath is saying that um, Carl, uh, the Pope, Pope Benedict XVI's renewal, uh, was it hermeneutic of continuity, mm -hmm. means interpreting tradition in such a way that it's not out of whack with the council, and interpreting the council in such a way that it's not out of whack with tradition. So the two head on, it's a head on clash. You can't reconcile that and that. But somehow, Benedict XVI seems to dance, doing some sort of dance up here, which is both that and that. It can't be done. But that's the hermeneutical continuity. So Bishop Gallerator says that the, the Romans in the discussions were pushing to get us to go with the hermeneutical continuity. No way, Jose, it's not possible. It's, it's, it's contradictory. The document proposed merely confirms that it is an illusion and unrealistic to believe that we could 
arrive at a practical agreement which would be good, suitable, and guaranteed, and even simply acceptable for both parties. Given the circumstances, it is certain that at the end, after much talking, we would arrive at absolutely nothing. So why bother to get involved in such conversations, such further discussions? Bishop Gabriel says this is the team. We're not going to agree. It's just not possible. Following on the Roman proposition, the true question, the crucial question is the following. Can we, must we, enter on a way of a possible agreement which is primarily practical? Is it prudent and suitable to maintain contact with Rome in view of a primarily practical agreement? For me, the answer to this question is clear. We must refuse to enter on this path because we cannot do an evil in order to bring about a good, besides an uncertain good, and because that will necessarily cause evils, certain evils, for the common good that we are in possession of, for the fraternity, for the society's past tense, and for the family of tradition. So there again, he's announcing what he's saying. He's saying it's purposeless and, and not suitable and wrong to get involved in discussions in view of a practical agreement. He's very clear. He's not hiding the things. Here are a summary of some of the reasons for my point of view. Firstly, number one. He's got number one, which lasts a page. Number two, which lasts um, two pages. Number three, which lasts uh, four pages. My Lord, is it possible to have copies of that? Uh, it's in French. Oh. Um, and I didn't, and number, number three lasts for four or five pages. Number four lasts for a few paragraphs, five yes, paragraphs, paragraphs for a few pages. Six pages. 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 One lasting page, and it's mainly quotations of the Archbishop. How can we submit to and obey authorities who will continue to think, to preach, and to govern like modernists? We have completely opposite purposes and aims, diff even different means. How can we work under their orders? It's common sense. Unless you want to become conciliar, how can you work under conciliarists? Because they're going to do everything they can to make you conciliar. And if you put yourself under them, they're going to make you conciliar. Archbishop of Fed. This is one you've already heard. It's so precious here today. Those are things easy to say. To re-enter the church. What does that mean? What church are we talking about? If you're talking about the conciliar church, then we who have struggled for 20 years against the conciliar church, because we want the Catholic church, we would be going back into the conciliar church supposedly to make it Catholic. That is a complete illusion. It is not the subjects who make the superiors, but the superiors who make the subjects. Second quotation of Archbishop of Philip. I don't even have this one. I do not think it is a true return of the Romans to tradition. It's like in a fight, when you have the impression that the troops have gone advanced a bit too far, you hold them back and you, and you put on the brakes. You hold them back. And they're now putting brakes on the thrust forward of Vatican II because the supporters of the council are going too far too fast. Actually, these theologians are quite are wrong to be upset. The, uh, these bishops are completely won over to the council and to the post-conciliar reforms to ecumenism and charismatism. So they needn't be afraid. What the Archbishop is saying is that these, these Romans who are putting brakes on the bishops needn't be afraid because there's no question of the bishops backtracking on the council. Apparently, they're now doing something a little more moderate, with a little more traditional feeling about it, but it doesn't go deep. The great fundamental principles of the council, the errors of the council, they welcome them, they put them in practice. That for them is not a problem. 
On the contrary, I would go so far as to say that the ones who are a little sweet are the hardest with us. The ones who are putting the brakes on a little are the ones that are hardest with us. It is they who would require the most that we submit to the principles of the council. In other words, those who seem to be a little less rabid, the Romans who seem to be a little less rabid, are amongst those who are the hardest towards tradition. Archbishop Lefebvre, quotation. It was perfectly clear, I don't exactly what it is, and it illustrates their state of mind. There is no question of them of abandoning the new mass. On the contrary, and that's obvious. That's why it may seem that a concession, that is why what may seem to be a concession is in reality only a maneuver to separate from us as many faithful as possible. This is why we've already had this quotation. They seem to be giving always a little, and they sometimes even seem to be conceding a lot. We must absolutely convince our people that it is no more than a maneuver, that it is a danger to put oneself in the hands of conciliar bishops and modernist world. It is the greatest danger threatening our people. If we have fought for 20 years to avoid the conciliar errors, the moment has not now come for us to put ourselves in the hands of those who profess these errors. Unquote. Bishop Gary goes on. Uh, reason, number, uh, reason number one was obey who, obey what. And the answer is it would mean obeying the council, it would mean obeying the supporters of the council. Second reason, diminishing the confession of the faith. In other words, a, um, a well, that's exactly that. The, the complete faith would not be completely professed anymore. Already, the society is discouraging criticism of Benedict XVI and criticism of, um, of the council. I remember when Campos fell, which I think was 2002, I wrote an article called Camp The Campos is Fallen. And I remember Bishop Ferdy calling me up and saying, oh, you shouldn't say that like that. So I, I changed a few phrases, but he didn't want me to say Campos is born. Way back in 2002. So, and, then, and since then, he, and now, Bishop Tissier wrote a very good essay on the theological errors of Benedict XVI, called The Reason and Faith Imperiled by Reason. And it's never been published by the society. It was only published by the Dominicans and everything. Because Bishop Foley didn't want it published, because it's against Benedict XVI. Uh, Father Kemperin told me that. We published now by the Dominicans again. By the Dominicans again, yes. We published. That's right. There's another work, oh, no. what, what is that? That's not being published by the Society. It's a book that's been. Oh, yes. It's Father Calderon's excellent uh, synthetic condemnation, let's say. An overall condemnation of the council, very closely argued, very coherent, very you know, real bird's eye view of the rottenness of the council. It's in Spanish. It's being translated into French, but the orders come from above. It may not be published by the society in French. The translation is already. The translation is there. Maybe they even set it up in print. The book is all ready to go. Red light. Because we don't want the council being condemned, we don't want Pope Benedict XVI being condemned. This is, for the SSPX, this is nuts. It's worse than nuts, it's suicide. It's the suicide of the SSPX. It's like buying a watchdog and then refusing to let him bark, muzzling him every night so that he can't bark. I mean, what's the point? Okay. Um, If we went into an agreement, how would we not go up again, diminish the public confession and defense of the faith? Um, how could we not be in go, be going against 
the necessary public protection of the faithful and of the church. If the church, if you're going to defend the flock, if you're going to defend the sheep, you've got to go public. It can't be done in private. Private is not enough. You've got to go public. You've got to condemn the errors in public that are threatening the sheep. You've got to condemn the wolves in public. He says, if we, if we get into a practical agreement, we're just not going to be able to defend the people against the errors of the council. It's just obvious. In this respect, if we make a practical agreement, we are, in the present circumstances, already getting into double-tongueness, duplicity, and ambiguity. The very fact is that it sends a message to everybody. We will be getting back into quote-unquote full communion with authorities who remain modernist. How can that not send the message to the people that modernism is not that bad after all? Or else the people say, well, in that case, the SSPX is bad after all. The people, the people that keep their heads on. So, necessarily, there's going to be a diminution of the defense of the faith. If we link up with people who are destroying the faith, who've got principles that destroy the faith, it's common sense. We cannot abstract from the context, that is to say, from the constant events and teachings in the life of the present day church. Repeated visits to temple processes and synagogues, beatification and soon canonization of John Paul II, John Paul II, Assisi III, preaching in, in time and out of time of religious liberty, and, and so on and so on and so on. We necessarily be tying ourselves into more of that. That's the garbage we've been fighting for now 40 years, not just 20. Besides, says, the, says Bishop Gavita, if we make an agreement, we will lose our freedom of speech. We will have to bank down our public criticism of facts, of the authorities, and even of certain texts of the council and the post and the magisterium. Well, that will all have to be closed down. And it's already being closed down within the SSPX, in the way I've been telling you. To can understand and illustrate these points, it's enough to see what happens to the trads that go over to Rome, from St. Peter's down to the Institute of the Good Shepherd. They are inevitably faced with the alternative of giving way or betraying their engagements, and they prefer to give way. In other words, the pressure is put on them, you've got to get more conciliar and less trad. Either they defy the pressure or they give way to it, and most they choose to give way to it. So backtracking uh, doesn't happen. So we, you can't say the practical agreement would be okay because we could always go in and then come out again. Uh-uh, that's not the way it works. It's just not the way it works. Quotation. Um, questions put to Archbishop of when we see Don Girard, that was the Benedictine monastery that quit the Archbishop at the time of the consecrations, and the fraternity of St. Peter, obtaining and keeping both the liturgy and the catechism without, they say, having given anything away, some people who are troubled at finding themselves presently in difficulties with Rome may be tempted in the long run to go over to Rome and up, out of time. <coughs> Quote, these people say, look at, look at Don Gerard and St. Peter's. They're getting on with Rome and they haven't given anything away. Unquote. Archbishop's answer. When they say that they haven't given anything away, that's false. They've given away the possibility of opposing Rome. They can no longer say anything. They must be quiet given the favors that Rome has granted. That's it. It's now impossible for them to denounce the errors of the conciliar church. Little by little, they are adhering, be it only by the profession of faith, and are being demanded of them by Cardinal Ratzinger. They're adhering to the errors of the council. I think that Don Gerard is on his way to putting out a little book written by one of his monks on religious liberty and which will attempt to justify it. Actually, I think it's six volumes. It's Don Basil. 
who wrote a six-volume book justifying religious liberty. The one that Archbishop of Ephesus said is an odious blasphemy. The religious liberty according to the So you start going to conciliar, you just give way the whole, it's, you, you put your little finger in the mechanism, you get your hand in, your elbow, your shoulder, and then you're just gone, you're conciliar. And that's happened to many of them. They're now completely conciliar. Bishop, Bishop Refan is now celebrating the new mass. And so on and so on. And a pretty ugly new mass apparently. I haven't seen it, and it's probably on the internet, I haven't seen it. Another quote to the Archbishop. Um, since the, the question, since the consecrations, there have been no more contact with the room. However, as you told us, Cardinal Arnold on on rang, rang you up to say, we've got to sort this out. Just write a little apology to the Pope. And he, is, he is, has his arms open to welcome you. <coughs> why not try this last step? <coughs> And why does it why does it seem to impossible to why does it seem to be impossible to to accept Cardinal Office of that just a little note of apology and, and anyway will be fine. Archbishop of Philip. It is an absolute that is absolutely impossible in the present climate of Rome, which is becoming worse and worse. Let us be under no illusions. The principles now directing the conciliar church are more and more openly contradictory of Catholic doctrine. In front of the Commission of the Rights of Man in the United Nations, Cardinal Casseroli recently declared, I wish to dwell for a little upon a specific aspect of the fundamental liberty of thought and action according to one's conscience, meaning religious, li li religious liberty. The Catholic Church and its supreme pastor, who have made of the rights of man one of the great themes, of, who, who has made the rights of man one of the great themes of his preaching, have not failed to recall that in a world where it made by man and for man, all organization of society has, it has sense only as far, as far as it makes of the human, human dimension a central preoccupation. Um, to hear that in the mouth of a carbon, says the Archbishop, not a word about God. The Archbishop goes on. For his part, Cardinal Ratzin, presenting one of these huge documents on relations between the magistrates and the theologians, affirms, he says, for the first time in clarity, that decisions of the magisterium may be not the last word on the subject as such, but a sort of provisional disposition. That's what we've seen now. The core may remain fixed, but the particular aspects which have had an influence, the circumstances of the time, may need a further rectification. In this respect, he may point out the declaration of the popes of the last century, the anti-modernist decisions, rendered a great service in their day, but now they are out of date. And so, whoop, we turn the page and the problem with modernism is gone. These such thoughts are absolutely sensible, <coughs> says the Archbishop. And finally, he says, the Pope is more ecumenical than ever. All the false ideas of the Council continue to unfold to be restated with ever more clarity. They are hiding them less and less. It is therefore absolutely inconceivable that we may accept to collaborate with such a hierarchy. It is absolutely inconceivable that we may accept to collaborate with such a hierarchy. Bishop Philly just doesn't agree with that. Father Pfluger, Father Nelly, Father Schmidberg, Father Dushava, these leaders of the society today that want the road, that want the society to go to the they just pay, they pay no attention to what the Archbishop says, or they say Rome has changed. That's their great theme. Rome has changed. Well, I wish Bishop Pfluger could come here to try to persuade you, or to give you his arguments why Rome has changed. Bishop, when Bishop Tissier went to Ensign and listened, he got Bishop Fuddy to say, okay, Your Excellency, you say Rome has changed, give me your arguments. And Bishop Fuddy gave, gave him a series of little indicators, of little anecdotes, of little things, of little swallows. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven swallows. He said, seven swallows make a sum. No, they don't. They don't. It's, it's straws in the wind. It's not a real change on the part of Rome. 
and the proof is the CC3 and the beatification of John Paul II. If Rome was really understanding tradition, how could it possibly beatify John Paul II? No, there's, there's a show of benevolence. Actually, the real, the real problem is this. That on the part of Benedict XVI, it's a real benevolence because a subjectivist can welcome even the truth in his system as long as the truth doesn't claim that it's the exclusive truth. If I'm willing to go into the collection of all religions, a tradition, a nice little traditional boy, and I look at everybody and I love everybody and I admire everybody, and I, I, and I make myself very nice to be admired and liked, and I know with everybody, everybody gets on it, that's okay. That kind of castrated tradition is fine. But if tradition goes in there and says, you are all a bunch of liars, easily most of you because of your denial of the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, the rest of you because you're denying the Holy Eucharist and or denying the splendor of the Pope, and you are all on the road to hell, and you're all damned. Well, that kind of tradition is not allowed. It's not kosher. It's not, it's not permissible. That's what the Archbishop said. I put it in a slightly colored way when I say it like that, but that's what it is. <coughs> um, so, it's inconceivable we should accept to collaborate with such a hierarchy. So, the argument of those wanting now the society to go in with Rome is that Rome has changed, but it hasn't. So, well, you can argue whether it has or hasn't. Listen to the arguments and see if they persuade you. If they persuade you, fine. But I think the Senate don't persuade me when I think, see things like the identification and, and the things that you know, the, the, the Romans keep on saying and doing. Bishop, Bishop Gallerator was up against what, what everything the Archbishop mentions is 20 years ago. What Bishop Gallerator is talking about is the doctrinal discussions of 2009 to 2011 which according to my watch is only one year ago, or is the last year, because my watch says we're now 2012, so 2011 was quite recent. And Bishop Gallerio says, these characters are talking nothing, they're talking the pure council, and they want us to go over the council. Hey, come on. That's the end of contact with Rome. Oh, no, no, no. Since we now know what Rome thinks, or Rome now knows what we think, well, then that's the moment to start talking again. That's what Father Flew was saying. So they just aren't functioning on doctrine. Like so many people today, they don't understand the primacy of doctrine. What is doctrine? What is faith? Was it one of you the same last night, I think? Every man has some faith. He believes in something. He's got some, some idea of what life is about, what life is for. It might be wine, women, and song. It might be making a million, a million, million dollars. It might be uh, becoming the best tennis player ever, ever appeared in Wimbledon. It might be, it might be, it might be, it might be getting to heaven. In any case, every man has some doctrine, some faith, some purpose in life, some conviction of what life is about, and some doctrine which corresponds, which expresses that conviction. So every man, in a certain sense, has some doctrine. Now, I said to you, the main difference between human beings is between those who have the Catholic doctrine and those who don't. That's the biggest difference. Because those who have the Catholic doctrine are marching to a completely different drum from the world. Whether it's Wimbledon, or money, or prestige, or glory, or, or wine, women, and so on, whatever it is, all of those are worldly things. The Catholic is not marching to this world. He's marching to a heavenly drum. Therefore, the Catholic is in a class of his own. He's the only one that is convinced that, that if he keeps out and dies in a state of grace, thanks to our Lord Jesus Christ, with the help of the sacraments, he'll get to heaven and he'll be happy for eternity. There is a next life. There is a heaven. There is a great risk of hell. All that is doctrine, which the church teaches. And the doctrine is simply the expression of a reality. St. Thomas says, when I say, 
I believe in God. I'm not believing in the proposition I believe in God. I'm believing in God. The, the, there's a, a reality which is object of my faith, and the doctrine is the expression of that reality. And that's it. I believe in God. So there's the proposition. There's the doctrine. God exists is the doctrine. And I believe in the God that exists. I believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Eucharist. I believe in these things. They're realities. I believe that they're realities. If a man doesn't believe them, he's marching to a completely different drum. How can people marching to completely different drums march instead? And the council change the drum. The council switch from believing in heaven to believing in this world. Guarding its face. This wonderful world. Everything is from man and for man. Not from God and for God, but from man and for man. Crazy. So, it's because people don't grasp the importance of doctrine that they don't see why the society's got to stay on the line of Archbishop of Earth. They think that Catholic life means being nice to everyone. And so we want to be nice to them on the world, so we want to go with the world, so we want to go with the council. The people believe, the television people have lost their grip on doctrine, they've lost their grip on reality, they've lost their grip on thinking. They, they completely lost grip on the truths of the faith, and they're all of them marching to some worldly drum or other. They just don't understand the importance of doctrine any longer. How many people, I was up here the other day, how many people th still today think, use their minds, on things material, on things electronic, plenty, on Sudoku, plenty, but on the realities of the next life, very few. Fidelity, question. You said, pointing out, pointed to Don Girard and others, Don Girard was the Benedictine who went over to the Conciliar Church after the consecrations. They betrayed us. They are now shaking hands with the demolishers of the church, with liberals, with modernists. Isn't that a bit harsh? Question. Archbishop of No, it isn't. They appealed to me for 15 years. They turned to me for 15 years, says the Archbishop, meaning the Benedictine monastery of Dongerard. They asked me as a bishop to, to ordain their candidates so that the monastery would have not only just Don Girard as a priest, but other priests. I ordained them for 15 years. They asked me. I always did it. It's not I who went after them. It's they who came to me to ask me for support and for their own, to do their ordinations, for the friendship of our priests at the same time as, they, as we opened all our priories to help their monastery financially. They all made use of us as much as they could. We did it and gladly and even generously. I was happy to do ordinations for them, to open our houses so that they might profit by the generosity of our benefactors. And then suddenly, I get a telephone call, we no longer need you, it's over. We're going to the Archbishop of Avignon. We're now in agreement with Rome. We've signed a protocol. It hasn't made me happy to have all of these difficulties with Rome. It's not, it hasn't made me happy that we've had to fight them. We've been fighting for principles to keep the Catholic faith, and they were in agreement with us. They collaborated with us, and suddenly they abandoned the true fight in order to go off and join the demolishers of the church on the pretext that the demolishers will give them some privileges. That's not acceptable. They practically abandoned the compact, the fight of the faith. They could no longer attack Rome. That's what Father Dublinia also did. He was once a traditionalist. He wrote a whole book condemning religious liberty, but now he writes in favor of religious liberty. It's not serious. One can no longer count on men like that who have not understood the doctrinal question. I think that in any case, these people are committing a grave error. They have sinned gravely by acting as they have acted, deliberately, and with an unbelievable uh, lack of seriousness. Bishop Garrity comes to his third point, which is uh, the doctrinal question, which is the essential problem. And it's subdivided into, he's got 
two, 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 three sections. And now it's all, for the moment, it's all Bishop Galloway's. But you can see how solid he is. We must look at the framework into which they would be intending to incorporate us. An agreement is, whether one likes it or not, uh, an agreement means, whether you like it or not, integrating yourself into their system, into a thought and into, into a given way of thinking, a given reality, which do not depend upon us, which depend upon their thinking, their theology, their action. And that's how they're going to present it. Compare the campus and the text seen by Monsignor Chino. Now, we have just seen in the doctrinal discussions what is their idea. It's pure modernism, just revised and corrected. In particular, there will be understood three principles that we would implicitly accept. Number one, Relativism, relativism, relativism of the truth, even dogmatic truth, and the necessity of pluralism in the church. Relativism is the truth, means that there's no absolute truth, all truth is relative. A pluralism in the church means that there can be all kinds of churches inside the church. There's not just one church, there's many. For us, we have the experience of the charism of tradition, which are good and useful for the church, but what we have is simply a partial truth as far as they're concerned. Tradition has a truth of its own, it has a charisma, a charisma of its own, it would be incorporated in the big tent because it's got something to contribute. But an exclusive truth, an exclusive and absolute truth, no way could say for the consumerists. Their modernist and dialectical system, which, which, which calls out for conflicts, would allow them to integrate us in the name of unity and diversity as being a positive and even necessary element provided that we are in full communion, meaning submission to authority and respect for the other church persons and realities and that we would remain open to dialogue and that we would always be in search of the truth. Catholics are not in search of the truth. We possess, by the gift of God, we possess the truth. We are not still and always looking for the truth. We've got it. I can always learn more, but if I learn more, that doesn't mean I don't have what I already have. I have the truth. I'm not looking for it. I know it. The proof of this is that they are ready to accept us after a recognition on each side of a necessary and deep oppos uh, doctrinal opposition. That's exactly for the flu. So Bishop Gallerita is saying that the Romans, all the Romans want is that the doctrinal differences be clear and recognized. What Father Kluge says is, as long as the doctrinal discussions were simply to establish the differences, now we can go forward to establishing a practical agreement. How can we implicitly accept such a principle? By an explicit integration in their system and by the official interpretation that they give of it, when it is the very foundation of modernism and when it destroys all natural and supernatural truth. It's accepting the relativism of tradition and of the one and only true faith. How can society go into such a thing? An agreement would mean necessarily then one relativism of the truth, relativizing the truth. Two, the interpretation of Vatican II in accordance with tradition. Three, the evolution 